Now, if you are able, will you please stand as God begins our worship service by calling us to worship him from his word. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. This is the word of the Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together in song. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Worship leader over there. Okay. I will build my house where the storm or tall on the rock. Set my hope in your love, O oh Lord, and your faithfulness will prove you are steadfast, steadfast, you are steadfast, Sorry, host, I'll call out by name each night. In your watchful care, I will rest secure as you lead us with your light. You are steadfast, steadfast. Shout for joy, I will raise my voice, hallelujah to the Lamb, you are saved. into God's presence, our God who is perfect, holy, and righteous. And just as God made Adam and Eve in, in holiness and righteousness, he makes us to be holy and righteous before him, being obedient to his word. But as we come before this holy and righteous God, we need to recognize that during the course of this past week, we have not been obedient, not perfectly obedient to God's word, that we come stained with sin. And so it is important for us to take a moment and confess, to seek forgiveness from our God. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to take a moment to confess our sins corporately together and then individually and silently before our God. So 
Please join me now as we confess our sins together in this prayer based on Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Father, these commands expose our sinful hearts. They reveal that we have embraced our desires more than the wisdom of your word. Forgive us, we pray, for impressing upon our children the values of the world more than those of your word. For the sake of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us lift up our individual confessions to our Lord in, in silence. Heavenly Father, you have heard our cry unto you, both corporately and individually. Forgive us, we ask, and this we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now for those who are able, please stand to hear the good news. Good news for all who have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news that comes to us from Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Amen. For those who have been forgiven, for those who have been made alive, through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us now lift our voices up in response to our God in song. Oh Lord my God, we lie in awesome wonder, we sing along the words that hands of me. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. And it sings my soul. My Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. That God is Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. Oh, I scarce can take it. Oh, that on the cross, on my golden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Oh, it sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how 
said amen you may have your seats sorry I jumped the gun on that one well good morning my name is Matt Greenberg I'm uh, one of the elders here at Truth Point and I get to lead us in our pastoral prayer but first we're going to do our responsive reading and our responsive reading comes from Psalm 119 uh, verses 89 through 96 and while you guys get to that I'm going to read something God guides us from his word, and we respond as a church corporately with thanksgiving and supplication to him who delights to hear from us through prayer because of Christ's finished work on the cross. Now let's read Psalm 119, 89 through 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Now let's go before our loving Father in prayer, uh, starting with uh, the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And gracious Father, thank you for the assurance that if we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us as a church receive that forgiveness now and let us believe that we really have been forgiven and let us live like it's true. Let us live in the freedom, freedom from captivity of our sins, and freedom to a life of holiness and purity. Father, we ask that as a church, we would know your blessings. We pray that we would see clear evidence that you are at work here. Let us see that evidence in the ways we relate to one another. I pray that we would be people marked by an obvious sacrificial love for each other. 
I pray that we would hold loosely instead of tightly to those things that you've given us so graciously, remembering that each gift is from you, our time, our money, our homes, our possessions. I pray that we would always be both willing and ready to share with those in need, free to be a blessing to them because of the true blessing we have in you. Help us be imitators of Jesus in the way that he loved us. Father, let us see clear evidence that you are at work not only in the way we relate to one another as brothers and sisters, but also in the way we relate to others who do not know you. We pray we would live before them in such a way that they see our good works and give glory to you. And if we are to live in these ways, we will need to be filled with your word. We will need to know it and obey it. So as we prepare to hear it preached to us, we ask that we would listen humbly and attentively, and that we would listen expectantly and prayerfully. Use it to confront and comfort us, to call us away from sin and towards holiness. We pray that we would be changed by your word. We praise you for raising a new pastor to care for Boynton Beach Community Church, uh, Sam Sutter. Lord, we ask that you help him boldly proclaim your truths to that congregation each and every Sunday as they worship you. We also lift up our missionaries, John and Amy Gordon, with Sport Exchange. We praise you that John just completed the requirements and is now licensed to preach in the PCA. We pray for him as he seeks to complete his ordination requirements. Lord, we also pray for the Gordon family as they plan to move back to the missions field of Panama. And finally, Lord, as our ushers come forward and we prepare to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings, we pray that you would help us to believe, believe you that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We know that all provisions come from you and that you call us to direct a small portion back for the advancement of your kingdom and church. Bless these offerings and use them for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this next song.
my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let these blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless and state and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well it is well with my soul so it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious life, my sin. turn and greet your neighbor with a piece of Christ. Kids, if you're going to the elementary class, you are dismissed now. See someone you don't recognize, would you please introduce yourself. Welcome him or her in the name of Christ. Okay, we're going to remain standing for the reading of God's Word. If you'd 
Wouldn't mind grabbing your Bible if you have it, opening it to Matthew chapter 7, or you can look at it in your worship guide. Today we begin the third and final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, that sermon taught on the mount the mountainside there in Galilee to the, uh, by the Lord Jesus to his disciples and to the crowds that were gathered around them. Uh, throughout the sermon, he's used uh, some uh, colorful and sometimes metaphorical language to describe the way of the kingdom, the way, that is, the road, the path. Our Lord speaks to our hearts to guide us in what should motivate us and what our lives should look like. So let's hear his words together this morning. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Brothers and sisters, this is God's holy word. Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, open our hearts that we might hear the word of your Son. Lord, these words we need to hear, Lord, for they affect us and meet us where we are weak. Oh, Lord, would you do your work within us for your glory and for our good, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. When I was a freshman in college... Alanis Morissette's song, Ironic, was released, and it was one of the biggest hits of that year. It was uh, playing on the radio, which we listened to back in those days, uh, seemingly all the time, and uh, everyone, it seemed, uh, had part of that song, if not all of the song, memorized. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it's a song that uh, consists entirely of listing a number of unrelated, supposedly ironic situations. Uh, A couple quotes, it's like 10,000 spoons when all you need is a knife. It's meeting the man of my dreams and then meeting his wonderful wife. It's like rain on your wedding day and so on and so on. It's it's a catchy song and Alanis has a very unique voice and as I said, it was was a, a huge hit in 1996. It wasn't the number one hit though. Number one song in 1996 was Macarena which may tell you about the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the quality of, of, of my, anyway. Um, but the problem is, at least for people like me and for people uh, who I hung around with in college, was that not a single one of the situations described in the song Ironic were, were actual examples of irony. Not one. 10,000 spoons when all you need is a knife is not irony. It's unfortunate. Same with a traffic jam when you're already late. That's not irony. It's an unfortunate situation. Rain on your wedding day is not irony. Now, if you had moved your wedding inside for fear of rain, but there was a sprinkler malfunction and everyone got soaked because of it while it was perfectly clear outside, that would be irony. I tell you, there were many conversations like this in the mid-90s. We didn't have smartphones. We talked about Isn't It Ironic by Alanis Morissette. Uh, It's not not ironic if you meet an attractive married man. I I meet people nearly every day who have that exact same experience. Um, Let the reader understand. We... Now, we don't know how to make sense of this. Um, Alanis is Canadian, maybe they don't teach irony up there, or maybe Canada is itself a giant irony, so the term gets jumbled. I need to stop with this humor. Um, or maybe she was playing 4D chess on all of us. She actually once claimed that the fact that nothing in the song is actually ironic is one giant, giant bit of irony, that that was the point. Um, it was a troll game, if you will. I don't know if I buy it. You know, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But I tell you this. 
not only because it has literally been on my mind for over a quarter of a century, but because it actually relates to our passage this morning. For here we find that something that appears to be ironic, if not downright contradictory, is before us. And we need to address it if we're going to understand the teaching that the Lord Jesus gives us. And it's a teaching, my friends, that we need to hear. Our passage begins with what has been called the most well-known Bible verse by non-Christians. Judge not that you may not be judged. And then five verses later, at the end of our passage, the Lord gives the command, do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. Now, he is speaking metaphorical. Everyone knows that. They know he's talking about human beings there. So that sounds somewhat judgmental, does it not? Is he being ironic? Or is he quickly contradicting himself? Has the word of God failed so quickly? No, of course it hasn't. And no, he wasn't being ironic. But we need to understand his words. Because as I said, we need to hear them. For they address a weakness in us. And this is the weakness. In our pride, we believe that we are able to discern others' hearts and pronounce judgment. While at the same time, we demand if not insist on being treated with charity by others. That's our heart. So today, we're going to look at the Lord's command for his people not to judge others by looking at what we naturally have and what we desperately need. First, this is our outline printed for you. We're going to consider the destructive critical heart within us. And then secondly, the charitable heart we must pursue. First, the destructive critical heart within us. Our Lord has already spoken in vivid terms to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount on how his people are to treat the sin that wells up from within them. In chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, for example, the Lord said, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Though the language is clearly metaphorical and not meant to be taken literally, the intended impact is plain. We are to actively mortify, which means to put to death, to kill the sin that so easily entangles us. That it is to be the Lord's disciples' um, uh, standard position of the heart to be fighting against sin, wanting to put it out of us, if you will. And in our passage, this lover of our souls, who Jesus Christ is, sets his gracious sights on the desire within us to to condemn our neighbors by acting to them as judge, jury, and executioner. He tells us not to judge others because that is the very thing that our hearts naturally, that is according to our fallen nature, desire to do. Now we first want to address, I'm sorry, we first want to understand what exactly the Lord is calling us to, or calling us not to here, to address the irony or the seeming contradiction within our passage. So here's the question when the Lord says, do not judge. Is the Lord here giving his followers a prohibition against any kind of critical faculty? Does he mean that we are never to determine whether a person does something sinful or not? Are we here commanded? to never address, confront, address, or uh, correct a wayward brother in sin? Is the Lord here forbidding his disciples from ever concluding that, for example, a law in the world is unjust, or that a lifestyle is not in accordance with God's design? Is the Lord here saying that discernment is not to be applied to the actions or the thoughts of other people at all? Is he outlawing us to make proper distinctions between right and wrong? Now, a bunch of questions that all ask the same question. And surely we must say that is what people who quote this verse back to believers from outside the Christian faith understand it to mean. You can't do any, if you want to be a consistent Christian, you can't do any of those things. And we must say that that is the plain reading of the Lord's words, as is the plain reading of Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, is that we must pluck out our eye and throw it away. So we want to understand, what is the Lord teaching here? Well, it's helpful to look back 
at how this idea of judging is used in the Bible to interpret Scripture with Scripture, as we say. And especially it's helpful when we look back at the very first time in the Bible when a human being is um, called a judge. A human being is accused of being judgmental. It's all the way back in uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 19, when uh, the men of Sodom... uh, uh, charged that, levied that charge against Lot. You may remember the context. The angels of the Lord arrived in that city the night before. It was to be destroyed because of its wickedness. Those angels who were believed to be mere men were taken in by Abraham's nephew Lot, at which point the wicked men of the city Sodom demanded that Lot present his visitors to be handed over to them so they might violate them in perverse fashion. They burned with disdain at Lot for keeping those visitors from them. And they called out to him from outside of the door of his house in Genesis chapter 19, verse 9. This fellow, that is Lot, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. A few verses later, the Lord would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. Now I mention this uh, uncomfortable yet true story from God's word, not for shock value, but for the undeniable conclusion that when looking at that passage in light of the Lord's teaching to us this morning, the implication is certainly not, well, Lot should not have been so judgmental. He needed to be more like the way Jesus tells his disciples to be like. Of course not. In fact, throughout Scripture, We are called in love to make judgments of various kinds very quickly. Two of the purposes of the Word of God were told in 2 Timothy 3.16. The Word of God, which is inspired by God, are to reprove and to correct. Proverbs 25.12 says, Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. King David wrote in Psalm 141.5, Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my, for my head. Let my head not refuse it. All of these passages presuppose that God's people make some kind of judgment towards others. In verse 6, the Lord teaches, again, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is likely referring to the sacred nature of proclaiming the gospel by the disciples and the treasures of the Father that are in heaven. And in instances with people who are especially hostile to his disciples, perhaps wanting to visit harm on them, it seems... And it's agreed upon that the Lord is advising discretion, that is, to make a form of judgment, keeping them from preventable suffering. And of course, in the middle of this very paragraph, we're even called to take the speck out of our brother's eye after first removing the log of our own. Though it be only a speck, a speck it still is. And so to say so is to make a critique, however gentle it may be. It is to make a judgment. So, to what exactly is the Lord admonishing us in his call not to judge others? Let's get to it at last. What does he mean? He means a proud and disconnected attitude toward and speech about others. He means by judging to presume to know the motives of others in what they do. To presume to know someone else's heart, the whole story. He means to look at others when they sin, for sin they will, and to think that you are above that kind of sin. That you are of another, that you are of another sort. Never could I do that. I am more worthy in my own righteous standing. Such is hypocrisy, as the Lord would say in verse 5. J.C. Ryle puts it this way, The Lord forbids a fault-finding spirit, a readiness to blame others for trifling offenses or matters of indifference, a habit of passing rash and hasty judgments, a disposition to magnify the errors and infirmities of our neighbors and to make the worst of them. My friends, if you have been forgiven of your sin by Jesus Christ, If you have been saved by his grace and not of yourselves so that you cannot boast. If you have received mercy that you have no right to claim before a holy God. 
how much mercy ought you to extend another? Not doing so is destructive. To them, yes, but also to yourself. Look at what the Lord says in verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Here we see the first self-destructive tendency. It is, uh, it is self-harm. It is masochistic to our souls, being judgmental towards other. And there's kind of uh, two parts to this uh, to this. Two parts to this self-inflicting harm nature of being judgmental. The first is that you're liable to judgment by God. All judgments in this world, all temporary judgments point forward to the final judgment. Everyone in this world. Of course, this does not mean if you struggle with being judgmental that God does not forgive you. It does not mean that on that great day you will not be forgiven. As we hear Paul's thundering words in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus but all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ we will all give an account to the Lord on that last day as that same Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what has been done in the body whether good or evil And the Lord is telling us that we will give an account for our uncharitable, condemning hearts before the Lord. We will, if you will, be judged for our judgmental hearts. And secondly, such a critical spirit will do something in the world. It will invite a harsh um, reaction from the world and make other people more likely to be judgmental towards us. Uh, The Lord is saying that, that if you want to be judged by others, if you want others to treat you with a rash and hasty judgment, if you want the worst to be assumed about you by your neighbors, then that's how you treat them. That's what he's saying. Such judgment, when we judge others, hardens our hearts. And yet that hardness does not satisfy us, but rather what it does is it invites other people to share in that hardness. It, it tempts people to sin. When you're harsh and impatient and unloving to your neighbor, it tempts them to be the same way to you. And now, if you're here this morning and you're wondering, do I have a critical spirit like this? The quick answer is yes, we all do. But, but would you ask yourself these questions? Am I pleased when something negative is found out about someone I know? Or or how do I feel when I learn of of a weakness that someone else has? Do I ever think of my own sin first when I consider the sin of another? And all of us at various times would answer these questions in very disconcerting ways where we standing before the throne of God, standing before the face of God, which, by the way, we are at all times. It is a temptation common to man. And the Lord who loves you uh, calls you to mortify this within you. Secondly, we're going to consider the charitable heart that we must pursue. If the destructive judgmental heart is to be mortified, is to be killed, then the heart steeped in charity, in mercy, is one that we ought to pursue at great personal cost. How often, my friends, do we think about, let alone pray about, intentionally living lives free of such a critical spirit the Lord is warning us against? How often do we pray, Lord, make me more patient with the world. Make me less judgmental. Make me, Lord, care more about my sin than the sins of other people. Are those prayers we often pray? God would love to hear those prayers. I came across a quote this week from the late Christian writer Jerry Bridges. Many of you have read his books. Um, He served with the parachurch ministry Navigators for decades, and uh, I believe he was uh, a member of a PCA church, actually. Um, He described once in an interview why he wrote his book entitled Respectable Sins, and it struck me as being particularly relevant for us who are now living in the midst of a presidential election. Listen to this. Bridges said, I observed for some years a growing tendency 
among conservative evangelicals to focus on the more flagrant sins of society, but to overlook their own sins of pride, selfishness, gossip, and the like. It goes back to this, he who is forgiven little loves little. Because of our self-righteousness, due to focusing on the major sins of society, we do not see our own desperate need of living by the gospel every day. Is there a more respectable sin, if you will, in this church, in the Christian church, in the kingdom, than self-righteously judging other people? I don't know that there's a sin more acceptable, more respected than that. And the Lord in our passage is taking aim at that sin. He's taking aim in love at that sin. And Jerry Bridges articulates for us what is to be the fuel of having a charitable heart. It is knowing how loved we are by God and how much we have been forgiven by him. My friend, do you realize how much God loves you? Do you understand that, that no thought is hidden from him? That he sees all and knows all? He has seen every sinful thought within you? He has seen every secret sin that you've worked hard to conceal from others? He sees it with crystal clarity. And yet, he loves you with perfect love. Perfect love that... John tells us it's meant to cast out all fear. Listen to this, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Christian, this is how God looks at you. Think about that. Let that sink in. Meditate on that. He does not treat you as your sins deserve. Let that be your song. Your God knows every fault of yours and his love for you cannot be calculated. He remembers you are dust and he forgives you. Never forget that. Remind yourself of that every day of your life. You are so forgiven. You are so loved. Now we may think that this command not to judge others might, might make life easier for us. That this call to be patient and long-suffering in the presence of others is a burden that God is lifting from us. And of course, all sin removed is burden removed. But, but it's actually very difficult. It is a great burden. It is a cross to bear that the Lord is calling you to. You are being called to suffer much. To reserve judgment actively in the presence of of people who live in a world of sin and whose hearts give themselves over to sins every day, every hour. And he knew this better than anyone as his disciples were constantly, he, he was with his disciples so much and the Lord Jesus was constantly hearing ridiculous things from them. We could say it was ironic if not for a thing Far worse than that, that the same people who fled from him and abandoned him when he was betrayed and handed over to be crucified had on the way to Jerusalem asked him to call down fire from heaven to destroy all the wicked people around them. A charitable heart, the very heart of Christ, is a difficult pursuit. But my friends, it is a worthy one. And indeed, it is the path that he calls all of us to who take his name. 
It is the call of mercy, long-suffering, and to refrain from judgment. So how do we do it? How do we do it? It's hard to uh, refrain from judging other people. It demands us to fight back urges to condemn others, urges that we've had since we remember being alive. How do we do it? It's hard. But in another way, and we're going to conclude with this, in another way, it is at least easy to articulate how to live a life free of this kind of judgmentalism. It is to live a repentant life. That the steps you tread are repentance with one foot and faith with the other. Repenting that you have fallen short of God's holy demands and faith that the Son of God gave his life for you and in him you are righteous. The repentant life is one that when you look at others does so with conviction to its core that God's mercy is your only hope in this life and in the next. It is one that realizes that because Jesus was the only person who ever lived that passed the perfect standard of God's holy judgment, and he was the same one who laid down his life and took judgment from him for you. So would you this day pray that God would help you to walk down the road of repentance? Would you cling to Christ and his righteousness by faith. In one of the most uh, beautiful gospel calls I've ever read, um, again, the great Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, said this, I think it just possible that some of, some of you may be ashamed of repentance. I do beseech you to cast away such shame forever. Never be ashamed of repentance towards God. Of sin you might be ashamed, of lying, swearing, drunkenness, of these, a man ought to be ashamed, and we would add to that our critical, judgmental hearts towards others. But of repentance, of prayer, of faith in Christ, of seeking God, of caring for the soul, never, never, so long as you live, never be ashamed of, of such as these. I think it's just possible that some of you are afraid to repent. You think you are so bad and unworthy that Christ will not have you. I do beseech you once more to cast away such fear forever and ever. Never, never be afraid to repent. The Lord Jesus is very gracious. He will not break the bruised reed nor quench the smoking flax. Fear not to draw near to him. There is a confessional ready for you. You need none made by man. The throne of grace is the true confessional. There is a priest ready for you. You need no ordained man, no priest, no bishop, no minister to stand between you and God. The Lord Jesus is the true high priest. None is so wise and none so loving as he. None but he can give you absolution and send you away with a light heart and in perfect peace. Oh, take the invitation I bring you. Fear nothing. Arise this day and flee to him. Go to Christ and repent this night without delay. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your great love for us, that you pursue us by your grace, that you call us, Lord, to see ourselves as we re really are, ransomed, forgiven sinners by a merciful and patient God. Oh, Lord, would you help us to extend that love to others? Would you help us, Lord, to repent of our critical spirits. Would you give us faith, Lord, that you will help us bear the burden that comes with suffering for being patient, for not judging others. Would you help us, Lord, to see our own sin, Lord, as being greater than the sin of the world and of more concern to our hearts um, as we walk with you uh, in your kingdom. Now, Lord, as we come to this table, we pray, Lord, that you would give us faith. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to believe that as surely as we take and eat of the bread and drink of the cup, so surely, Lord Jesus, did you come into the world to die for us. And so surely do you, Holy Father, receive us as righteous in him. Lord, help us to feast on you by faith. Grow us, we pray, in grace. Nourish our souls, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'd like to invite the servers to come forward for communion and for the musicians to join me on stage as we make our way to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he has called us to keep and to take until the end of the world. Let's uh, confess the faith, uh, the faith that, as we read in Jude, Uh, was once and for all delivered unto the saints. This is a meal for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. So let us make the good confession together. We'll be confessing this morning the Apostles' Creed printed for you in the worship guide. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, This table shows forth true divine judgment that was done on your behalf. Jesus, the perfect son of God, the perfect son of man, who never judged anyone sinfully, who always showed patience, who always spoke in perfect truth. Jesus took not only man's judgment, but God's judgment. And he did that to save you from it. In the prophet Isaiah, it was prophesied about the Messiah that he would drink the cup of God's wrath to its dregs. That is, to drink every last drop of it. And that is what was happening on Calvary. That's what was happening when Jesus was on the cross. He was drinking every drop of God's wrath that your sin deserved for you. And we celebrate that as we come to his table. We remember that he was once and only once given over to death to save us from eternal death. And if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you are a part of his beloved church, then my friend, this table is for you. I invite you to in a moment come forward, exit uh, your row to the left, come forward, take the bread and the cup, return to your seat, and then we'll partake of the meal as one, as one body, as one uh, church. Uh, If you're new with us, we have a couple of different options. We have Regular bread in the big trays that are being held by the servers. And then gluten-free bread is in a little bowl or a basket on the table. You can grab it as you walk by. We also have uh, wine and juice, white grape juice on the outer ring, red wine on the inner ring. However you'd like to participate in the Lord's death by proclaiming it, uh, take whichever of those you'd like. But if you're here this morning and you haven't put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't repented of your sins and become a part of of his beloved church, then I want to welcome you. I want you to know that we will not judge you. We are welcome. Uh, we, we are so happy that you are here and you are welcome to return every Lord's Day. But we would ask, for the Bible says so, that you not partake in this meal because it reflects something you don't believe and it would not do you good. But turn to Jesus Christ. He gave himself for sinners like you. And he has never, nor will he ever, turn away someone who repents and believes in him. The night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body given for you. And then after the meal was over, our Lord took a cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sin, and is shed for many. Brothers and sisters, when you're ready, would you come to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ? To you, refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Word can bring us sweet relief for every pain I feel. Oh, 
But oh, when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all my hopes decline. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to thee, though prostrate in the dust. Hast thou not bid me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain. No stiller ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. Oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still, here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will, and wait beneath thy feet. Thy mercy seat is open still, here let my soul retreat. Attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. His mercy seat is open still, and he has given this meal to show forth the reality of that. The Lord Jesus said, as I repeat to you, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal was over, the Lord, who would go on to drink the cup of divine wrath to its dregs for you and for me, our Lord took a simple cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing to him one final time. Jordan stormy banks I stand and cast the wish for high to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Our world is wide extended plains. Shines one eternal day. The God, the Son, forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound, I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. I am bound. No chilling no chilly winds, no poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are felt in fear no more. I am bound. I am I am bound for the promised land. I am bound. I am bound. I am bound for the promised land.
Oh, when shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and live in His presence? Oh, I am bound, I am bound, I am bound for the promise. Is land. I am bound, I am bound, I am bound, from this land. See ya. Oh, I am bound, I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. Last round, just the voices. I am bound. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. His judgment has brought you peace. Go from here knowing it. But don't leave yet. Coffee Fellowship would love to get to know you better. Bless Lord's Day.